Okay, folks, let's get started. How was your Thanksgiving break? I bet everybody's really dying to get back and get into biochemistry. No? I was a little bit. Look at it this way. You go, you, you go from one turkey to another. Yeah. <laughs> the old lead balloon. That's as good of a joke as I have for you today, folks. Uh, believe it or not, we're in the home stretch. We have, counting today, three lectures. Woo! The end is near. Uh, I did not bring note cards with me today. I said I was going to. I did not bring note cards, so I apologize for that, number one. I've got number two and number three, I think, here also. Uh, I will bring them on Wednesday. Okay? So on Wednesday, you will have note cards uh, for sure. And if you're really, really desperate and you really, really, really have to have your note card, you can come by my office and pick one up. But realistically, it's not going to change things an awful lot if you go 48 hours different without your note card. But it's a 5 by 8 I can tell you, if you want to get a 5 by 8 and practice on it, you can see it's a pretty good size note card. But you have to get the note card from me. Remember that. So the note cards have to be gotten from me. And you don't have to use it, but you have to turn in a note card with your name on it that you got from me with your final exam. If you don't, you will lose points. Okay? So make sure that you get a note card from me and you turn it in with your final exam. Are we clear? Okay, that's number one. Number two, I had a big presentation this morning and I was working my presentation last night and forgot to send you guys an email saying the exams are graded. So the exams are graded. Um, and let me just say a, a few words about the exam. I was totally delighted with the exam. Uh, the performance on the exam was one of the highest averages I've ever had. Uh, average was 76.5. Uh, I have a curve. I will post it as soon as class is over today. I'll post the curve on the website so you can see it uh, for the overall sum of your grades of the first two exams so you can see exactly where you stand. The low score on the exam was 15. The high score was 103. I had, I think, two or three people who had perfect 103, including the extra credit uh, questions. So I was very impressed and I was looking, as I uh, looked at the grades themselves, I saw that that average went up because a lot of people in the low to mid jumped quite a bit. And so uh, it was very, very satisfying to me. So I, I just felt very, very good about that. And I, um, I uh, really uh, respect what people did with that. So that, that's kind of cool. So it was worth the wait, uh, hopefully, for you to get your exam back. As always, if you have questions, uh, let me know and we'll go with, there, with that. Okay. Now, uh, number three is... Uh, we have a final exam coming up. That final exam is in here on Monday at 9.30. And I will do a review session for it. In fact, I have put in for, uh, I believe it's Friday evening at 6.30. I have put in a request for a room. I will announce that when I get the room for sure. Uh, but I, uh, the, the review session will almost certainly be Friday at 6.30. It gives you a chance to get dinner and then get review session. And as before, I will videotape that. OK. Now, um, let's see. What else do I want to say here? I want to say uh, we're, we finished almost everything about gluconeogenesis. The last thing I did not talk about on Wednesday of last week, which seems like a long time ago, by the way. I know. Um, <laughs> the last thing I did not talk about there, I wanted to save for today because it's kind of involved. And so I want to make sure everybody had the same opportunity to see it and ask questions and so forth about it. And it's the combined regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So um, I'm going to start, excuse me, start out by showing you a complicated figure. Actually, no, I'm not going to start with that. I'm going to start by telling you the sort of philosophy of uh, uh, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis uh, uh, regulation. Okay, the philosophy is that Glycolysis is a catabolic pathway. Gluconeogenesis is an anabolic pathway. All right? These pathways, for the most part, occur in the same place, which is the cytoplasm. Gluconeogenesis only has two reactions that aren't in the cytoplasm. One's in the endoplasmic reticulum, and one is in the mitochondrion. All, right? All the other enzymes of both pathways are in the uh, cytoplasm. Moreover, many of the enzymes are the same enzymes in both pathways, which means that many reactions are driven by concentration. Which side of the equation has 
necessary, necessarily large enough amounts to drive a reaction one way or the other. Okay? Now, uh, that means that we have to be careful to regulate these pathways. If we don't control these pathways, we're going to have that futile cycle that I talked about before. Where imagine, let's imagine the following scenario. Let's imagine I had glycolysis and gluconeogenesis going at the same time. What would happen? I would start with pyruvate. I would put in six triphosphates to get to glucose. I would burn glucose and get two triphosphates and be right back at pyruvate. I wouldn't have gained anything, but I would have lost four triphosphates. And then I started again, and I go up and I go down. And each time I turn that cycle, I lose four triphosphates. Okay? That's futile because it doesn't give the cell anything but heat. All right? So it's important that cell not waste its energies, and the cell doesn't waste its energies by controlling pathways like that in what we call a reciprocal fashion. Reciprocal regulation is something you're going to hear a lot about today, and you're going to hear a lot about it on Wednesday also. Okay? Reciprocal regulation. Well, we start to see it right here. All right? Here's a schematic going down for glycolysis on the left, going up for gluconeogenesis on the right. Okay? Let's, some of these things we've talked about already. Let's look at the regulators of this pathway. What you see on the screen are the allosteric regulators, the allosteric effectors of the important enzymes. In glycolysis, we know they are hexokinase, which is not shown, PFK, and pyruvate kinase. In gluconeogenesis, they are these two enzymes. They are this guy and also glucose 1,6-phosphatase, which is also not shown. So we, we just sort of throw out the first one up here. We just throw it out. These guys and these guys we're very interested in. And as I said, when I talked about glycolysis earlier, the most important pair are these two right here. PFK and FBPase 1, or fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase, if you want to call it that. Okay? PFK and FBPase 1 all right, are regulated reciprocally. All right? F26BP we talked about before. Notice that in very tiny amounts it turns this enzyme on. In the same tiny amounts it turns this enzyme off. It has opposite effects on the two enzymes. Okay? Look at AMP. AMP turns this guy on. AMP indicates low energy. With low energy we want glycolysis to go. PFK is activated. We look over here. PFK, I'm sorry, uh, AMP turns off FBPase 1. Right? Citrate turns off this guy. Citrate turns on this guy. Right? It's reciprocal. It's not perfectly reciprocal. There are things that affect this one that don't affect this one. But when we look at the thing as a whole, F26BP is a reciprocal regulator. AMP is a reciprocal regulator. It has opposite effects on catabolic and anabolic enzymes. Okay. To a lesser extent, we see some of that down here. ATP turns this guy off. ADP turns this guy off. Okay. But we don't see the same kind of reciprocal regulation that we saw with PFK and FBPase 1. All right. Now, reciprocal regulation turns out to be very, very important when we have pathways occurring in the same place at the same time or that can occur at the same place at the same time. Cells generally regulate them so that they don't occur that way for the most part. Okay, well, it gets even a bit more complicated than that because the question arises, I told you earlier when I talked about PFK and I said the most important regulatory enzyme, for, uh, the most important regulatory effector, effector for PFK was fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, right? And I just showed you that it was a very important regulator for FBPase 1 as well, so unfortunately, and you're going to say this as well as I do, unfortunately it means we need to understand how do cells make and break down fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. That you're going to see. It's going to look much more complicated than it is. So I'm kind of conditioning you for, for what I'm going to show you. And I'm also going to tell you that I can throw a million words at it. It's kind of like the mechanisms of serine protease action. We can throw a million words at it, but until you sit down with it and look at it yourself, it's going to seem like that's a million words. Okay? So let's take a look at the overall pathway by which fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is made and regulated. Remember, this is, the, this is the reciprocal regulator of PFK and FBPase 1. 
Okay. This looks com oh Jesus, yeah. This looks complicated. That's always the first reaction. It's not as bad as it seems. There's a lot of information on here, and the the guts of it's right here. Okay. All this is showing us is on the side, we're breaking it down. On this side over here, we're making it. There's an enzyme that makes it, and there's an enzyme that breaks it down. OK? An enzyme that makes it, and an enzyme that breaks it down. All right? Now, let's um, take a look at this enzyme. This enzyme is one of the most fascinating enzymes in biochemistry. Because this enzyme is actually two enzymes. The same protein molecule catalyzes the synthesis and the degradation of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. It's the same protein. This protein has two activities. One activity makes it. It's called PFK2. PFK2 catalyzes the synthesis of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. FBPase 2 is the other half of it, and it breaks it down. Make it, break it down. Here's the enzyme. Here's the two activities. Well, as we can see, at any given time, only one portion of the enzyme is active. Only one portion of this enzyme is active. Boo! Good job. Not my day today. All right. What's the difference between these two? Well, the difference is a phosphate. If we put a phosphate onto this enzyme, we flip the activities. That turns FBPase 2 on. That turns PFK2 off. If we take the phosphate off, we favor the reversal of that. Well, that's not surprising. You've seen before okay, how covalent modification of enzymes can affect enzyme activities. We're simply putting a phosphate on, we're taking a phosphate off. It has opposite effects. This causes the PFK to become active, PFK2 to become active. Going to the right causes the FBPase 2 become active. Right? What catalyzes these things? Well, protein kinase A, there's our friend. Protein kinase A, when it's activated, catalyzes. This enzyme getting a phosphate on it and FBPase 2 being active. Let's think about what that means in terms of the cell. If FBPase 2 is active, not looking at the screen, what's going to happen? We're going to break down F26BP, right? When we break down F26BP, what's going to be the effect on FBPase 1 and PFK1? PFK is activated by this molecule, so if I take the molecule away, what's going to happen? Less active, right? If I go to the right, PFK1 is going to become less active. F26BP is an allosteric inhibitor of FBPase 1. If I take it away, what's going to happen to FBPase 1? It's going to be active, right? Well, since those are the critical enzymes controlling whether we're running glycolysis or gluconeogenesis, now you can look at this and say, in general, what's going to happen to glycolysis and gluconeogenesis if I phosphorylate this guy right here? Well, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to break this guy down. Okay? I'm going to favor gluconeogenesis. And look, when glucose is scarce, that's exactly what I want to be doing. I want to be making glucose. Remember the flight or fright? Remember this grizzly bear chasing me and my adrenaline starts flowing and I said that we had that kinase cascade and the kinase cascade activated protein kinase A? There's our protein kinase A. And I said that the result of activation of protein kinase A resulted in production of glucose. This is one of the ways in which we make glucose. Okay. Not surprisingly, if we're making glucose, we don't want to be breaking down glucose, so we inhibit glycolysis because we're no longer activating PFK with fructose 2 6 bisphosphate. Okay, so we've got in one simple step, depending on how you look at it, of course, but in one simple step, we've reversed those two pathways. Well, what happens now when I've got my glucose stores back up? The grizzly bear has, I've escaped the grizzly bears and I, bear and I'm sitting around and eating, <coughs> eating pizza. 
I've got plenty of glucose around. And glucose is a poison, right? So I've got to deal with that glucose, right? I've got two things I can do with glucose. I can break it down. I can turn it into glycogen. We'll be turning it into glycogen later in the week. Today we're going to break it down. So when we no longer are activating protein kinase A, we are no longer phosphorylating. Phosphoprotein phosphatase becomes active. And by the way, phosphoprotein phosphatase is activated by insulin. Insulin is causing this process to go to the left. Why? Glucose is a poison. We've got to do something with that poison. We're going to take phosphates off. We're going to activate PFK2. We're going to inhibit fructose bisphosphatase 2, FEPase 2. Okay? What's going to happen? We're going to start making fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, activate PFK1, glycolysis is going to run. When fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is present, FBPase 1 is inhibited, and gluconeogenesis stops. Insulin favors going to the left. Epinephrine favors going to the right. OK, now, that, in a nutshell, is what's happening. Now, I want you to lay this out yourself, all right? I'll be happy to answer any questions, but I want you to just sit down, lay it out, and you'll discover it's really not that complicated. Yes, back there. What about for, like, non activity where it's, you have to have abundance nor scarcity of Yeah, so what if you have the in-between situation, basically, is what you're saying. We have an in-between response. So set, the body will generally modulate glucose levels to provide glucose as needed as much as possible. So it, it, it maybe we'll, we'll phosphorylate, okay? Maybe uh, in, in this case, where we, we burn some of our glucose, we'll phosphorylate some of this, but not all of this. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Thanksgiving took all the questions out of you guys. Yes? So the glucose production, that's happening in like the liver only, right? So glucose production, gluconeogenesis is happening primarily in the liver and a portion of the kidney. That's correct. Okay, so look it over. If you have questions, uh, see me. But that's uh, basically what's up with that. So, okay, that is the last of what I want to say. Oh, here's the enzyme, by the way. There's, there's the enzyme that's there, okay? There's the part that puts the phosphate on. There's the part that puts the phosphate off. And there's that tiny little ribbon that connects the two of them. And it's an amazing enzyme, absolutely amazing enzyme. Okay. Well, we turn our attention now to something that is an easy metabolic pathway. It's going to concern us for the rest of this week. So you say, well, it's not an easy pathway. Well, I'm going to convince you, I hope, that glycogen metabolism is actually one of the easiest metabolic pathways to learn. Its regulation is complicated, but the pathway itself is extraordinarily simple. Okay? Let's talk about glycogen. We talked about it earlier in the term. And glycogen is a storage form of glucose that animals use. It's a storage form of glucose that animals use. We talked about how plants use amylose and amylopectin. We combine those and we get starch. Right? But plants don't have glycogen. What's the difference between glycogen and amylopectin? Anybody remember? There's more branches in the glycogen than there is in the amylopectin. So they're all polymers of glucose. Amylose has only alpha-1,4 bonds, so it's just a long linear chain. All right? Glycogen has alpha-1,4 linkages, but every now and then it has 1,6 branches. There's a 1,6 branch. Okay. About every 10 residues or so, glycogen has a 1-6 has a, a branch, which means that glycogen, even though it's full of glucose, just like amylose is, is structurally very different. It has a lot of ends. The more branching we have, the more free ends we have at the non-reducing end. You remember what the non-reducing end is. Is this a reducing sugar or not a reducing sugar? How many say it's a reducing sugar? How many say it's not? 
I'm sorry, but the person who said it was reducing sugar was right. The very first one has a free aldehyde. Okay? The very first one has a free, it's alpha 1, 4 linkages. There's 1, 4. That means if this is the end of the molecule, that would actually be uh, a CH2OH. That would be an OH there, and that could become an aldehyde. In this case, it would be, yeah. Okay? All right. Now, that's not important. I just thrown that out at you just to, see, just to see what you remembered after all that turkey. Okay? The difference between, amyl between glycogen and amylopectin, they're both branched. Amylopectin also has 1, 6 branches, but it only has about every, one, every 50 residues or so. Now, I'm going to tell you in a second why that's the case, but that's the, 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 the structural difference between, uh, between amylopectin and glycogen. Did you have a question? Uh, yeah. Isn't that initial glucose subunit before all the branching takes place on the very internal chain? Wouldn't it be non-reducing because it's covalently attached to that little seed molecule that starts the whole thing off? That is the seed molecule right there. So, I, so, so if this is the end, then that's going to be an OH right there. So that OH makes it a free, a, a free anomeric carbon on an aldehyde, on an aldose, will always make it a reducing sugar. OK, I'll show you structure later if you'd like to see it. it comes in. All right. Now, amylopectin is chemically different from glycogen in just the extent of the branching. Now, why is that important? Well, the reason it's important, and this is why you're able to be an animal, and I'm not talking about it in any sense except for <laughs> walking around, okay? You people, all right? <laughs> I know where your minds are. <laughs> all right, how are you able to be an animal? One of the most important ways in which you can be an animal is thanks to glycogen, okay? Glycogen is stored in our muscles. It's also stored in our liver. It's in muscles for very quick energy. It's in our liver for providing that buffer to keep our glucose levels balanced, hopefully, over time, all right? The reason that the structure of glycogen is so important to being an animal is because glycogen has so darned many ends. All those branches, all those ends are important because, as you will soon see, the way that glycogen is broken down is from the ends. More ends, more breakdown. More quick release of glucose. Animals have to run. They have to escape. They have to catch prey. They have to take notes in biochemistry. All those things require quick energy. Okay? Having a system that has a lot of ends allows for a lot of glucose to be released very quickly when necessary. Plants don't have those needs. Plants don't go running away from their prey. If they could, they might evolve into something different, but they never made anything of themselves. They just kind of sit around like plants, right? If only we had thought of making glycogen plants save themselves. Where would we be now? But no, okay? You guys are really quiet today. It's a Monday. <laughs> okay, so do you see the fundamental difference? So that chemical difference really plays out as a very important thing. Well, let's look at the metabolism of glycogen. Actually, this is what, there you go. Is that the figure you were referring to? Wasn't the very, very internal molecule not a native glucose molecule, though? It is, it is. It's a native molecule. It's, it's, it's a glucose. Yeah. So every molecule, everything in it is a glucose. What's that? You want to draw that on the, on the exam you said? No, you've got to draw them. We'll line it up and we'll put it on top and see. Nope. No partial credit. Sorry. All right. Let's uh, look at the breakdown of glycolysis. There's what glycogen looks like. Okay, that's these little black guys here. All right, um, fates of glycogen. All right, glycogen turns out to be important as a source of glucose, but of course we know glucose is not the end of the story because glucose by itself doesn't do anything except poisonous. Right? We want to have the energy from glucose, which is why we have glucose around in the first place. And what this is showing you is what happens when we break down glycogen and how it's converted into energy, the glucose in it. I'm going to show you in a second an unusual reaction. It's a really cool reaction. The glycogen isn't broken down directly into glucose for the most part. 
99% of it is broken, or maybe 90% of it is broken down into this guy right here, glucose 1-phosphate. Where did we see glucose 1-phosphate before? Anybody remember? Not glycolysis, no. Galactose metabolism. Do you remember when we had the UDP glucose and it got released and it was released as, you don't remember that, glucose 1-phosphate. <laughs> I told you at the time, glucose 1-phosphate will be important in glycogen metabolism because it can readily be converted into glucose 6-phosphate. This enzyme, phosphoglucomutase, allows this interconversion. It can go up, it can go down. It's pretty much equal in terms of which direction it goes. <laughs> what did they do in this, in this textbook? Phosphoglucomutase. <laughs> That is now an acceptable name for this enzyme. <laughs> if you want to call it phosphoglucomutase, you can. If you want to call it fofoglucomutase. <laughs> or fufuglucomutase, I don't care. <laughs> now, glucose 6-phosphate can go to glycolysis. That's important. Glucose 6-phosphate can get released as glucose and go into the bloodstream if this happens in the liver. Glucose 6-phosphate can be converted by the pentose phosphate pathway. We'll briefly talk about that next term into ribose. And ribose is very important for making nucleotides. Okay? So this molecule is central to a lot of different pathways. Well, how do we get glucose 1-phosphate? Let's take a look at that. Here's the end of a glycogen molecule, one of those ends that we talk about, one of those millions or thousands of ends that are on the end of a glycogen. We're sitting at it right now with an enzyme that breaks it down. The enzyme that breaks this down, that catalyzes this reaction, is known as glycogen phosphorylase. P-H-O-S, P-H-O-R, Y-L, A-S-E, unless you're a textbook publisher, in which case it's called phosphorylase. <laughs> All right? Now, this is a reaction like you haven't seen before. It looks very straightforward. Here we've got a glycogen molecule. Here we've clipped off a, um, I'm sorry, here we've clipped off a glucose 1-phosphate, and here's the glycogen that's lost one of its residues. Very straightforward, right? Well, not quite. Look what's happened. We put a phosphate on there in the process. How do we put that phosphate on there? We didn't use ATP. Now, when we talked about putting ATP onto glucose before, we said that took energy, right? Where did the energy come to put this phosphate on here? Any thoughts? Wild ideas? Yes, sir. Why is it energetically favorable? It is energetically favorable. Well, why? Why is the negative? Why is the delta G zero prime negative? There's energy in breaking this bond. <clears throat> okay? This bond has some energy in it. The energy of breaking this bond is transferred to making glucose 1-phosphate. So it tells us that that alpha 1,4 bond has some energy in it and that we uh, can use that energy to make something. Well, why do we want to do that? Well, it turns out whenever we can save energy, that's good, just in general, right? Insulate your glycogen, right, so that you don't... No. All right. You don't waste energy, you see, if you insulate your glycogen. Yeah. All right. Anyway, we got a phosphate onto here, and we didn't have to invest ATP energy. We just saved a triphosphate, right? Muscle cells, if I am running and jumping, I don't want to burn my ATP breaking down my glycogen. I want to burn my ATP using the energy from glucose. This allows me to put a phosphate on there without using any ATP energy. This is really cool. Because now I can isomerize this guy to make glucose 6-phosphate, and bang, I'm in glycolysis without investing any ATP to start. Very good. Okay? So this saves a reaction. The enzyme is called a phosphorylase. The name, again, tells us what it does, meaning it uses a phosphate to break a bond. It uses a phosphate to breaking a bond. It's different than a hydrolase, which uses water to break a bond. <clears throat> so instead of using water, we're using phosphate to break that bond. Okay. Now, we're almost done. Okay? We're almost done. 
There's only one other thing I have to tell you, and that is the fact that glycogen phosphorylase is a finicky enzyme. Of course it's a finicky enzyme. It has to be, right? Glycogen phosphorylase will only work to within about four residues of a branch. It gets to that point. It starts up here. It keeps chewing, chewing, chewing. It takes these red guys off here, and it says, I ain't going any further. It will not work any closer than about four residues to a branch, the branch being a 1,6 right there. Okay? Then something else has to happen. Well, the something else that has to happen is another interesting enzyme that has two activities associated with it, but we branch them into one name. We can memorize that it's called a transferase, and we can memorize that it's called an alpha-1,6 glucosidase, but we, being biochemists are kind of lazy, we like to call both of these activities debranching enzyme. I'm going to tell you what debranching enzyme does, but these two reactions are catalyzed by the same enzyme known as debranching enzyme. What happens? Well, let's look to see what this enzyme is doing. No, follow the blue guys. Here's the three blue guys here. The three blue guys get transferred from this branch down to this branch. That leaves behind one green guy, and they're all glucoses, by the way, so they're all glucoses, they're not different. The difference being this guy is linked by an alpha 1,6. The enzyme, debranching enzyme, uses water to break that guy off, and we get free glucose. This is the only place we get free glucose in glycogen metabolism. then glycogen phosphorylase can now has, has a new template it can work on, and it can go chewing back until it gets back to another branch. The green one is, is the only free glucose that's released in the process. What's that? Right. So you might, you might wonder, well, why in the other case does it use glucose 1-phosphate? It used phosphate to make glucose 1-phosphate. Why in this case is it releasing free glucose? It's not being consistent. No, there's something different that's here. What's different here? Well, it's using water, but why doesn't the other one use water? Why doesn't this one use phosphates? My question. It's not a high en enough energy bond. An alpha 1,6 does not have as much energy as an alpha 1,4 does. It doesn't have the option. Okay. Well, fortunately, there's only one of these per branch that's made, so the cell says, OK, I'll take and use some ATP and put you into glycolysis. Bang. You got it. So debranching enzyme requires ATP. Debranching enzyme, no. no. There's nothing here that requires ATP. Oh, Getting that into glycolysis requires ATP. Right. OK, questions? Now, believe it or not, with the exception of the phosphoglucomutase that's needed, oh, turn that guy off. The phosphoglucomutase that's needed to convert the glucose 1-phosphate into glucose 6-phosphate, you've just seen how you break down glycogen. Bang. What enzymes did we see? Phosphoglucomutase interconverts glucose 1-phosphate and glucose 6-phosphate. It's a mutase, so what does that tell you? It has a 1-6 intermediate, right? And yes, that can be released as a free molecule. It does get released as a free molecule. The second enzyme was glycogen phosphorylase that broke 1,4 bonds to, to close to a branch. And the third enzyme was debranching enzyme, which changed the branch and released free glucose. Three enzymes, entire pathway. Cool. Glycogen breakdown is very simple. I'm going to talk about glycogen synthesis in a second, and you're going to see it's almost as simple. All right? Here's the phosphoglucomutase. This is the uh, glucose 1-phosphate. There's the intermediate. There's the product, glucose 6-phosphate. This is a reversible reaction, either direction. We can, if we have excess glucose 1-phosphate, it'll go to the right. If we have excess glucose 6-phosphate, it will go to the left. When would we have excess glucose 6-phosphate? What conditions would give us excess glucose 6-phosphate? What metabolic pathway, hint, would give us excess glucose 6-phosphate? 
gluconeogenesis, right? So if cell is building glucose, it's going to be building glycogen too. And we'll see in a second that glucose 1-phosphate is needed to make glycogen. So if we're making things in, glycolysis, in gluconeogenesis, we're going to the left. If we're breaking things down in glycogen breakdown and glycolysis, we're going to the right too. Yes, ma'am? Um, which one did you say is reversible? The entire reaction is reversible. All of it? Yeah. Yep. What are the yellow things? That's just part of the enzyme. So there's the active side of the enzyme. Okay. There's the rest of the enzyme. There's a serine residue that's involved. That's, that's really all. It's just showing you that, that side chain. Okay. All right. DIPF would, be, would, t would do what to this enzyme? Inactivate it, right? Okay. I should have asked you what the molecule was that will do it. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump down to glycogen synthesis because I think if we talk about the metabolism and then we save the regulation for later, uh, we'll be better off. So let's talk about the synthesis of glycogen. It's just about as simple as the breakdown is. All right? There's one extra enzyme. One extra enzyme. So the first enzyme, again, we think phosphoglucomutase for interconverting. Now we want to make glucose 1-phosphate because we want to make glycogen. But it turns out that glucose 1-phosphate can't be added to a growing glycogen chain. Why? Well, remember that that alpha 1-4 bond had some energy in it, right? If it has energy in it, then we have to put some energy into making that bond. There's not enough energy in, in water, essentially, to make that bond. So we have to use a high energy intermediate in order to make that alpha 1, 4 linkage. The high energy intermediate we use is this guy right here. You saw it before. You saw it when we talked about galactose metabolism. This was a molecule I described as an activated intermediate. An activated intermediate is a molecule that has a high energy bond, and there is the high energy bond. It's a molecule that has a high energy bond that uses the energy of that bond to transfer a part of itself to something else. So an activated intermediate is a molecule that has a high energy bond, and it uses the energy of that bond to transfer a part of itself to something else. Well, the part of itself it's transferring is this guy right here, glucose. And what it's going to do is, is attach it to position 4 of a glucose on the end of a growing glycogen chain. So if we're going to talk about the enzymes of, of glycogen synthesis, we have to talk, first of all, about how do we make this molecule. Once we know that, everything else is pretty much like glycogen breakdown. Okay. Well, let's take a look uh, at, at how we make that. Here's the reaction that makes UDP glucose. Glucose 1-phosphate, OK, you know how that's made now. Glucose 1-phosphate, we combine with UTP. We make UDP glucose, and we make what's called pyrophosphate. These are two phosphates joined to each other. Let's count the phosphates. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. We haven't lost any phosphates. But they've reorganized. Now we have this guy and we have this guy over here. It's called pyrophosphate. P-Y-R-O-P-H-O-S-P-H-A-T-E. Pyrophosphate means two phosphates covalently linked to each other. Well, we've just made an activated intermediate. What did it take to do it? It took a triphosphate. UTP has the same energy as ATP does. Has the same energy as GTP does. Though that triphosphate is high energy, the cell is having to invest some energy into making this bigger molecule. That's a fundamental principle of anabolism. Building bigger things takes energy. It took energy to make glucose. It's now taking energy to make glycogen. OK, we're nearing the end, believe it or not. All right. UDP glucose. What's the next step in the process? Well, the next step in the process is adding that glu glucose to a growing glycogen chain. This is the reaction that's catalyzed here. There's the UDP glucose that we just made. 
Here's carbon number four of the end of a glycogen chain right there. In this reaction, this glucose gets transferred over there. The energy of this bond is used to make this high energy bond. Okay? We've now made a glycogen that has one more glucose on it. The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction has a very simple name. It's called glycogen synthase, S-Y-N-T-H-A-S-E. Glycogen synthase catalyzes the addition of glucose to a growing glycogen chain. The product is UDP, of course. And UDP can be converted into UTP and then reused again. Now, we're only missing one thing. What are we missing? How do we get branches? All right? Well, for branches, we've got a really complicated enzyme name that's used to do it. But I prefer to call it branching enzyme, as I'm sure you will too. And there is, believe me, there's a mouthful of the name is about that long. Okay? But in essence, branching enzyme will create alpha-1,6 branches about every 10 residues. Here's an alpha-1,4 linkage. Here's branching enzyme. Bang. Got it. So branching enzyme is creating the branches. So what enzymes have we seen in glycogen synthesis? Well, we saw phosphoglucomutase as before. I didn't give you the name to the UDP, synthesis, UDP glucose synthesizing enzyme, did I? No. Do you really want it? No. Nope. Should we give it a name? I'll tell you what the real name is, and then you can tell me perhaps a, a, a more humorous name. The real name is UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. Steve. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> These are all male names. Do we have any female? There's never a female. It's, it's just true. Every year when I ask for names, people always give me male names. Helga. Ursula. Tina. Tina. Amaryllis. Tina. Amaryllis. Amaryllis. Shaniqua. I'm sure they like to spell that one. <laughs> so you may call it either UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase, which is the real name, or... I want to vote on this. I don't know. Well, well, I think the best names I've heard were Steve, Tina, and Ursula. Lucy and Lucy. Okay, Steve, Tina, Ursula, Lucy. Steve, Tina, Ursula, Lucy. Lucy's the simplest one, so I think people went with Lucy. Lucy in the sky with diamonds, right? Uh -huh. what, was the, what was the real name? So. It's the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction right uh, here. Okay? Its, it's real name is UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. Okay? UDP glucose pyrophosphorylase. Okay. Now, that's the breakdown, that's the synthesis of glycogen. Um, I'm going to uh, cut short earlier today, but I, I'm, I'm not going to finish quite yet. I just want to say one last thing, and that is on Wednesday I'm going to talk in detail about the regulation. Okay? Uh, the regulation is reciprocal, but it's also complicated. It involves both covalent modification and allosteric regulation. If you want to look over a lecture material before you come to lecture, next time might be a good one. Okay? See you Wednesday. Yes, sir. What's that? You're know, the PPI. Why is that a pyrophosphate instead of bisphosphate when it's free floating? Um, I, I think the terms are interchangeable. Okay. Yeah. So pyro. I use means yeah. Side. Just just bond. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair I didn't catch you said we can pick up our exams. Yes, they're available to be off ALS 2011. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat>